ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another year of ticklish business. I'm Kristen Lopez, joined, as always, by Emily Edwards. And with the start of a new year, we always decide to look back at the year before by celebrating the classic films that we discovered the previous year. So this is our new Discoveries of 2023 episode. We don't have a guest because we have enough picks to fill an entire episode. Plus, we have listener selections. Before we get to that, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, you should. We do all sorts of additional bonus content, including our podcast Doubled Features, looking at remakes based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime, and another season of But Have You Read the series looking at classic film literary adaptations. We also give people access to episodes and content two days before they go live everywhere else. If you have not gone over there and watched our video of our interview with Maria Cooper Janice, you should definitely do that. It was a lot of fun. We also give out regular care packages of gifts and let you guest on an episode. That's at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And don't forget, Emily and I are both authors. Please order our books wherever you get books. Our Redbubble store has all sorts of art and merchandise designed by Samantha Richardson, as well as Terrence Hiltz featuring your favorite stars. You can find that at ticklishbiz redbubble.com. And don't forget, if you are ever looking for an old episode, our entire archive going back to episode one is available for free over at ticklishbusiness.podbean.com. So let's get to the episode at hand, New Discoveries of 2023. This episode is always my favorite because I get to just wax rhapsodic about the stuff that I discovered. But Emily, you came on to this show late in the year and you are our quintessential classic film novice. So I wanted to know, what was your criteria? How hard was this list to cobble together for you? As I mentioned before we started recording, the key hiccup was the fact that I am not a chronicler of movies that I watch. So I've been running a book podcast for many, many years, and I'm really good at keeping track of the books that I've read. I was less good at keeping track of the movies. So it was a little bit more of a memory game to start than perhaps criteria for movies that I'd watched. But I do have very, very strong feelings about media that I consume. It's very difficult for me to often expose myself to new media, which is actually one of the reasons why I love doing this show so much, because you've introduced me to so many new things. I have a blend of things that I've watched for the show, and then some other things that I watched because I needed to spread my wings into the classic film world. And then I also have a couple of movies that I watched because they star my favorites. And I thought, let's expand my repertoire beyond movies that I've seen a thousand times that I know I love. So that was where my perspective went. I look at Letterboxd all the time as I tell people, I have a huge letterbox account going back years. You are welcome to follow me on Letterbox if you were a listener and look at all of the wild stuff and celebrities that I should not cop to having seen as many of their movies as I have. This is usually easy for me to cull. What I was concerned about is, is I started a new job at the beginning of last year that was very labor intensive. I worried that I would not have nearly enough movies for this episode because I didn't feel like I watched a lot of stuff, or at least not as much as I have in the past. I keep lists of my classic film watches, and usually a good year is, you know, like 200, 250 classic film movies. That is a far cry from when I was in college, and it was like 300, 350. I've never been able to get back to that number just because life. I was very worried that I just did not watch nearly enough. Shockingly, I had a lot of choices, so much so that right before this episode, if you head over to our not as much used as it should be website, ticklishbiz.com, you can read all the choices that I went through. I have a huge list that includes everything. I was really happy to see just how many things I watched, and I really got into Criterion Channel this year. I was actually not watching as much TCM stuff. I was watching a lot of stuff via Criterion, which if you don't have a Criterion channel account, I cannot stress getting one enough because it is 
a fantastic blend of old Hollywood, new Hollywood, international, silent. I was kind of proud of myself with all of the foreign films that I discovered and the silent movies that I watched on top of this list that I'm going to give, which I think is not representative of any of that, but it's movies I wanted to talk about. That is a roundabout way of saying that as much as my list was varied, and if you read the full list, you're going to be like, oh, she watched a lot of stuff. The five that I ended up picking are very much just me. Don't judge me, but also you can judge me. Let's get into it with our number fives. Emily, I want to start with you. What was your number five new discovery of 2023? I definitely come from a fandom of this actor, as we've discussed many times. And when we did our Halloween month, I went down a little bit of a monster movie hole. I will admit that number five is Invisible Man with Claude Rains because I didn't realize how much I love Claude Rains. He's not hunky. Normally when I go at the actors that I go for, you've got your dapper guys in suits and Claude Rains just ain't that fella. But I loved this movie so much. I loved it more than Fan of the Opera, which I really, really liked. And I loved it a lot more than The Mummy. And I loved it a lot more than Dracula. And I loved it a lot more than Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, which is a nightmare of a movie to watch with a person with a modern sense of humor, as much as I appreciate what they did, which is another movie that I enjoyed for the first time this year. But I will say Invisible Man with Claude Rains was phenomenal and also really scary. Claude Rains, if you're looking for sexy Claude Rains, I always tell people, but this also says more about me, because if you play a jerk in film, I will automatically gravitate towards you. It's a psychological thing. But Notorious. 1946 is Notorious. One of my favorite movies of all time. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal, but he's... Future episode, because that movie is just perfect on so many levels. It's the best Hitchcock, don't at me. No, Invisible Man is great. And I think that it does not get enough appreciation because it's not showy compared to your Frankensteins and your Draculas. Have you seen the Dark Universe remake they did? No, I haven't. It's worth it. I'm biased because there's an acting choice in there that I appreciated, but it's worth it. It's worth it. I have seen the Kevin Bacon Invisible Man, where it's Hollow Man. Hollow Man is not technically a remake of Invisible Man. I have a very soft spot. It's so fun, though. It is, but it is. That movie is up until a couple years ago, until I moved to LA, that was my best friend and I would watch that every year and find something new to make fun of about that movie. I remember watching it when it came out on VHS, because that's how old it is. And that's how old I am watching it at a party and everybody being like, oh, this is a great movie. And me being like, is it friends? I don't know. I buy Josh Berlin as a medical scientist. (laughs) (laughs) About as much as I believe Claude Rains as a psychopathic invisible person. That is all to say that it's great. Yeah. I love that movie. It's great. I'm super excited to see more Claude Rains. Yes. We did a lot of Claude Rains movies, Claude this Rains. and Four Daughters, too. Mm-hmm. Also Claude Rains. That's a spectrum. Yeah. Amazing guy. <laughs> Obviously, so Casablanca. My number five, I had a, a short list of eight. Anything could have been five. Four through one were very easy for me to figure out. Five could have been any of the movies that I will mention in my small honorable mentions. This year was a weird one for me. If you've listened to the episode or the series long term, so we did a whole series on Elvis movies, Elvis biopics. Last year was the year that Priscilla came out and essentially was going to end, putting air quotes, the series. Emily and I are going to be talking about Priscilla in some point. So I figured I should probably watch a couple more Elvis movies. I'm slowly been working through the Elvis cinematic oeuvre. And then I saw Priscilla. You guys will hear my thoughts on how that movie messed me up this year. But I decided to continue this Elvis watch. So my number five is 1958's King Creole. This is often considered the best Elvis movie, or at least the movie that feels most like a movie that just happens to star Elvis in it. I can definitely see where people say had Elvis been given the opportunities to have good scripts and good directors, the kind of actor that he would have been, because it's all very present in King Creole. Directed by Michael Curtiz, who did Casablanca. It's got actual actors. I say that as if most of Elvis' movies didn't have good actors. I mean, he worked with Anne Margaret and Barbara Stanwyck. But this one is very much a film noir in the sense that Elvis plays a teenage boy. Don't think he was a teenager when he made it. Who lives in New Orleans 
ends up becoming a singer and really just becomes a nightclub chanteuse for a guy named Maxie Fields, played by Walter Matthau. And Walter Matthau is the most despicable heavy that I've ever seen in a movie. He is just so venal and evil and just err. Every time he's like on screen, it's very intimidating. A lot of it is because Walter Matthau is so craggy and a man. He's standing next to baby faced soft boy Elvis Presley, and you're just like, he's going to snap this kid in two. And Elvis is really good. I know that he really wanted to be taken seriously as a performer, and you see all that. He's got a very rugged, rugged by Elvis standards. James Dean Mien, you can see that he probably was going for kind of like a Brando thing, and it works. It really does work. He's very good in it. The songs are good. He's got a really great chemistry with Carolyn Jones, who plays the mall, who is very clearly a prostitute. (laughs) And we make no bones about the fact that Walter Matthau's character has been pimping her out to his friends and whatnot. It is a dark, sad noir. I really appreciated it. And if anything, not that I don't love the Viva Las Vegases and even some of the weird Elvis movies that he made towards the end of his career that nobody likes. King Creole really does showcase the talent that could have been had he been given better opportunities. It's hard to feel bad for Elvis, considering the whole glitz and glamour of his entire existence. But you also had me at Walter Matthau. An inordinate number of my top 10 movies star Walter Matthau. I love him as an actor. And now I might have to go and watch this because I love Walter Matthau so much. I still have a lot of Elvis movies that I need to get through, and I haven't even gotten through some of just the more famous iterations of them. But yeah, this one's definitely one to see. If you want to see Elvis, the actor, definitely King Creole. I can see now why Austin Butler said that was his favorite Elvis movie to watch when he was studying to be Elvis. Austin Butler, anytime you want to come on the podcast and talk about Elvis movies, Welcome to do that like you're listening. Emily, what's your number four? I think my number four is probably The Lady Vanishes, which is old Hitchcock. I will admit that I had to watch it with the subtitles on because sound mixing of those movies, a little difficult for my old, old ears. Fantastically interesting. As someone who I like Hitchcock movies, but I am more attuned to the American flashy ones. It was just really interesting for my film education to go back and watch one of the older ones. That's really all I have to say. I have not seen this movie. I feel very, very sad. Hitchcock and I don't always agree, so I have avoided this. I don't really know why, but I feel like I should probably rectify that at some point. I think it's on Criterion Channel right now, so... It's available everywhere because I doubt (laughs) it has any kind of copyright attached to it whatsoever. I watched it on, I think, Prime, but I'm not entirely positive. But it's like pretty much on every streaming service. So it's one of those ones where you're like, you're searching Hitchcock of like, I want to watch Dial M for Murder. And it's like, nope, you're getting the lady vanishes. But watch it because it's really, really fascinating. I wouldn't say it's as, I'm probably going to get some heat for this. It's obviously just not as commercial as the ones with Chris Kelly and Cary Grant and all the people that you recognize. It's very good and well-constructed, and that's all. I hope to see it this year. Hopefully, it'll be on my list come next year. I'm going to stay in the 1950s for my number four. I don't tend to watch a lot of what is on FXM, which used to be a really interesting channel and then just became a way for Disney to show more of their Marvel stuff. But between the hours of midnight and 4 a.m., they do show classic Fox films. I was perusing one day and I decided to tape something. I saw the 2017 version of My Cousin Rachel when it came out, and I thought it was fine. Rachel Weiss is hot. Sam Claflin has a very punchable face. I watched it. It was fine. But I started to read the book this year, the Demaulier novel, and I realized that I had never actually seen the original film. It was on FXM. Thought I'd tape it. I should have known that I would love it because it's directed by Henry Coster. If you've listened to this series long enough, you know that I love most movies directed by Henry Coster because he just went for the weirdest stuff despite being a real journeyman director. Shameless plug, and it's a plug I give all the time, The Unfinished Dance from 1948, the delightful, beautiful story of a ballerina played by Margaret O'Brien who spends the whole movie worrying about how she accidentally hobbled a woman. That's the plot of the film. Love it. It's great. It's great. Attempted murder with children. I figured... 
Henry Coster does not steer me wrong. So I watched this. It's got a script by Natalie Johnson. Really good setup for a film. And the movie is just prime 20th Century Fox gothic lit. For people that discovered Dragon Wick, based off of our recommendation when we talked about it for the Vincent Price episode, oh my gosh, go seek out My Cousin Rachel. It is the delightful story about a guy who lives with his cousin, his male cousin. It is very gay. The cousin goes off and gets married to a woman that he has just met, who is supposedly their cousin, Rachel, and dies. Rachel shows up to send condolences, and the entire movie is this guy being like, I want to screw this woman, but I also want to screw her over because I'm pretty sure she killed my cousin boyfriend. There's this weird push and yep. pull between desire and the supposed, because de Maulier is, is writing it, tension that supposedly coexists between men and women and our inability to trust each other. If you like Notorious in the sense that it's the story about one stupid dude continually just slut-shaming a woman, this is kind of the same thing. It is the story of a guy who spends the entire book and movie being like, I don't know, I love this girl, but I can't quite put my finger on the fact that she might be trying to kill me. Or not. She <laughs> might be, but I'm not really sure. Maybe not, but it's all beautifully gowned and it's sumptuous. And I cannot stress the hotness of its leads. Olivia de Havilland plays Rachel. She is gorgeous. This is post heiress Olivia de Havilland. She's supposed to be older. I think Olivia de Havilland was in her 30s when she made this, but you would think that they trotted her out as a 55 year old woman, the way they keep talking about the age difference it's between in Hollywood back then. Come on. Exactly. Exactly. But everybody keeps talking about she's so old. She's so much older than the male lead. And the male lead in this case is Richard Burton. This is Richard Burton's debut, his first film. He was 25 years old. And I cannot stress, in a year in which I said more than once, that man is beautiful. Why does he exist? This was one of those movies. Because the minute Richard Burton shows up in the over-the-knee boots and the coat with the cravat and the hair, you're just like, stop. I can now understand why Elizabeth Taylor just threw everything away for this man. Nothing about Daphne du Maurier is easy. And for you to be 25 and making your debut in a du Maurier adaptation, that is a testament to skill or just the sheer horniness of the casting director who needed a man that beautiful to be in the movie. One or the and other, I cannot maybe stress, both. this is a very horny classic film. It is so thirsty. And a lot of it's coming from Burton. If you've watched Cleopatra or the VIPs or really anything he made with Elizabeth Taylor, no, that wasn't just reserved for Liz. That was reserved for women and maybe some men. It is a lot. And it is just overwhelming. Richard Burton, hi. I knew this before, but it coalesced. So thank you. My kids and Rachel, if you were just looking for like a sumptuous costume drama with a lot of beautiful, horny people in it, that's also a little gay. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, Novels I mean, are it's... usually gayer than the movies, obviously. <laughs> but yeah. That's my number four. Emily, I don't know how you're going to top that but you, you're not, welcome to try i'm not i'm gonna go back to a movie that is just ish before our cutoff of 1970 and it's gonna be really surprising to people because it's uh wow this year watching this for the first time but bear with me i'm gonna go with goldfinger 1964 here's the thing i love james bond in a really weird perverse political way i love james bond because it's so messed up and i'm not saying anything new here Goldfinger is so famous for a million reasons, and mostly it's the Shirley Bassey song. It's so weird and so Cold War that it blows your mind when you get into the politics of it all. And I know, again, all James Bond movies, super political, even the really, really stupid, goofy ones. All of my books that I write are set during the Cold War. They're set in 1950, now in 1951. So I've been really, really steeped into the early Cold War BS of it all. And Goldfinger, for some reason, I went on a marathon and I watched all of the James Bond movies this summer. But Goldfinger stuck out to me as the one that was the most critical of America, even more than the Soviet states. 
And it's just so bizarre. And they're trying to hide all of it with the German to American dubbing and the exploding Fort Knox. And it's stupid as all get out. And I love that you can watch it as a popcorn movie where it just being really, really, really dumb. But also Ian Fleming was a really good writer and he set a really good baseline for this critique. And it's not even a critique because it is so pro-capitalism and anti-communist. It's a mind mess of a movie. And then when you watch it in conjunction with all the other James Bonds, I'm like, ooh, this is messy. And I've always wanted to do a mini podcast or like a limited series podcast on James Bond and talk about the colonialism of James Bond and the capitalism versus communism of James Bond and the messed up misogyny of James Bond. And every single movie can have its literally own nine and a half hour episode about all of this messed up stuff that's happening in James Bond. And for some reason, Goldfinger is one of the worst. So Goldfinger is a Connery, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fun fact, when I wrote my book, I watched my first and as of right now only Connery Bond, which was Dr. No. Yeah. I have not seen any of the other. Bond is Pierce Brosnan for me. I think yeah, Daniel here. Craig a little mm. bit. I was forced to go see On Her Majesty's Secret Service. So I've seen a Lazenby. The only one, I believe. And I've seen a Dalton. Seen a Dalton. But the Connery ones, I'm sorry. I have not seen He does that nothing one. for me. I understand. Your first Bond is the one that is the Bond when you start watching a Bond movie. So for me, it was Pierce Brosnan. It's really, really good, especially because the couple that he's in, they deal with a weird transition from, ah, there's a wall. And then suddenly like, ah, there's no wall in Berlin anymore. They had to juggle all of that because all of James Bond is a commentary on the Cold War. But Sean Connery does very, very little for me because they play into like the misogyny of James Bond really hard, where the other ones are a little weird. And frankly, I'm going to get so much heat for this. Roger Moore does nothing for me as James Bond. He is so boring. It's just really, really dull. I will say if you're looking for a Connery movie where at least I said, OK, I get Connery. You can tell where this is going to go. It's on my list. If you go over to ticklishbiz.com, it made the list of overall discoveries it's called Woman of Straw with Gina Lola Brigida. It is a very twisty 1960s version of a psychosexual thriller with Gina Lola Brigida playing a housemaid for an old geezer played by Ralph Richardson, who is terrible to her. His nephew is Sean Connery. And his nephew's like, we could kill this guy. And she's like, cool. It gets really twisty and very horny. And it's a lot of fun. Supposedly, I think it came out right around the time of the second Bond. So I think he'd already done Dr. No. Nobody wanted to see him play a villain. So he never did it again. I was like, no, actually, I already think Sean Connery's kind of a jerk. So I buy this. He should have stuck with that. Yeah. I also like Marnie Sean Connery. So yeah. Keep that how you will. I'm going to stick with the 60s for my number three. This was another discovery of mine that I just was like, how have I not seen this movie before? From 1964, what a way to go. If Samantha were here right now, she'd be so excited because I know she loves this movie. This is directed by Jay Lee Thompson, who I did not know had done anything else. I probably should have. I only knew Jay Lee Thompson as the director of Cape Fear, the original. I can't believe that this was two years after Cape Fear because these two are just complete opposite ends of the spectrum. There's another J. Lee Thompson movie I watched this year with Diana Doors called Yield the Night, which is also very great. J. Lee Thompson, very underrated director, should not just be known for Cape Fear. This movie, I would love to know how this was sold to people. How did somebody sit down and say, this is the movie I want to make and... The studio was just like, yes, go forth and make this film. This starts off with Shirley MacLaine, who plays Louisa May Foster. She's on the therapist's couch talking about how she is cursed because every one of her husbands has met an untimely end. And the movie from there essentially is a flashback to all of the multiple times that she has been married. To say that that's the plot of the movie, that's all you really need. Because from there, it just becomes this utter spectacle of fantastic costumes. I forget how many costumes they say Shirley MacLaine goes through in this movie. Edith Head was nominated for her costumes in this. I don't know why she didn't win. Because they are just 
so exquisite and so modern. Some of them are just like, she'll release a strap and the dress will change. They're just technical marvels. The hairstyles that Shirley MacLaine is wearing are almost Seussian in nature, just this cadre of height and tendrils. But mostly, I was just in love with all of the different men that she marries. She has various husbands, including one played by Gene Kelly, her one husband played by Paul Newman, of all people. He's this boho guy who just wants to talk about art, man. Why does nobody let him just create? He meets his demise in this very weird, ultra artistic way. But the best part, this, the part where I knew that this movie was magic to me, is she meets this cattle baron played by Robert Mitchum, which, again, he did Cape Fear, so he clearly wanted to rework with Jay Lee Thompson again. She marries him. Everything is well and good. They own this big cattle farm. And at a certain point, he goes in to milk the cow. He gets down and he puts his hand under the cow and he realizes that it is the bull. The bull kills him. So it ends on a hilarious Robert Mitchum gets killed by a bull. And it's also a gay joke at the same time. I know what this movie got made. It is hilarious. It is hilarious. It is gorgeous to look at. And I'm not just talking about the costumes. The cast is beautiful as well. You can't go wrong with Shirley MacLaine and Paul Newman. It is just a comedic masterpiece. I do not know how this movie evaded me for so long, but I'm so glad that I found it because it's magic. Start off 2024 right by joining Ticklish Biz's Patreon, just like Allie Moore, Amy Hart, Andrew Hoppy, Christine Meyer, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Gates, Jacob Haller, Jonathan Watkins, Chris Painter, McF, and Rachel Clark. Listen to episodes 48 hours early, receive exclusive membership items, and even guest on an episode. You also get access to bonus series like Based on a True Podcast, Double Features, and our new series, But Have You Read the Series? It's all patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. I need to see this immediately because it's you do. starring three of my absolute biggest old Hollywood crushes, including Robert Mitchum, who I love inexplicably. I need to see this. And Shirley MacLaine is so funny already. Done. Sold. This needs to go on the list right now. It's so great. I kept saying at a certain point, what is this movie? How did this get made? Somebody needs to tell this to me right now. It is great. It is so great. Emily, what's your number two? My number two is something that I watch for the show. You introduced me to a lot of really compelling and interesting and important things this year. This was actually the first episode that I joined in on, and it blew my mind because I had been toying with a Western idea for a book for a really long time, and I haven't yet figured out how to do it. But I started watching Westerns a couple of years ago because I was like, I've never seen The Magnificent Seven. That's not the movie I'm talking about, obviously. And I need to see it. And I loved it. So the Oxbow incident blew my mind. A lot of it is because Dana Andrews is so phenomenal in it and the writing in it is so brilliant. And Henry Fonda is there as just an incredible presence and guiding hand, obviously, for, for the production. It's just such a wonderful movie. One thing that we talked about in the episode is just how condensed of a set it is because I write mystery novels. And I love it when things are constrained. Ooh, I need to go back and rewatch it and possibly every single Henry Fonda Western ever made. Something that we were talking about with Maria Cooper Janis when she was discussing her father's Westerns and just how when you think about John Wayne Western, my dad was a huge John Wayne fan. I've seen every John Wayne Western and then my husband's from Texas. So he's introduced me to all of the Clint Eastwood Westerns. Bite my tongue about that because I'm sure we'll do one eventually. I had known that aspect of Westerns before, but I had never seen this kind of Western before. I haven't yet really parsed out everything about it that I want to pull and glean for my own writing, but it made me really inspired to work with the Americana West. I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Connecticut. Everything I've written so far takes place in New York City. And I lived in Los Angeles for 15 years, and it took me a really long time to get used to just existing in a place that was that spread apart. And that's a weird mind thing that happens to you. And so many Westerns are about the vista 
and how long you have to travel in order to get somewhere and all the things that can happen to you when you're in the open West and the untamed West. And I kept thinking about how Puritan literature, when you think about how the people, when they first moved to Massachusetts, they were like, oh my gosh, the woods are so scary because the devil lives in the woods. And so that's how the Puritans viewed the woods and wilderness and things like that. And then you bring that out West and there's nothing but wild and wilderness because you haven't tamed it yet. It's just beautiful American zeitgeist. And then to have a Western that is hinging on the fact that there's a hundred people basically trapped in a gully and they're penned in. And I'm going on and on and on about this absolutely insane movie that I watched. And I loved it so much. It's so good. And I urge everybody to listen to the episode that we did on it because it really is a testament to why classic film is so necessary and also why the Western is such a vital genre. It's about more than the West. It's about so many different elements. If you're looking for another Henry Fonda Western to watch that also has some great moral ambiguity, My Darling Clementine is another one that I think is really good. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that somebody else appreciates that movie as much as I do. Loved it. And I really was hoping that after uh, Jordan Peele made Nope, we were going to see a really interesting resurgence in Westerns. And I don't think it's really happened yet, but I feel like it's going to happen because we have to have a really interesting grappling with America and outlaw culture. And it's just going to be really, really fascinating when we start working with the Western again. Yeah, I thought the Coen brothers remake of True Grit and James Mangold doing 310 to Yuma would bring Mm -hmm. the Western back. And then we got that really crappy Magnificent Seven remake and they were like, we want spectacle Westerns. And then it just died out again. I'm all for bringing back more morally ambiguous looks at the West. So my number two actually dovetails very nicely, Emily, with what you are talking about, because I too discovered a movie about the West It is a classic that somebody's going to say, it took you how long to actually watch it? And my response to that is because I thought it was going to be really painfully long to watch. And that is George Stevens' 1956 film, Giant. Giant is three hours. It's three hours and 21 minutes. That is a commitment. Killers of the Flower Moon tested every ounce of my ability to sit through three hours. And I'm not casting stones on Scorsese, but... Three hours and 21 minutes of Giant sailed. Sailed. I was not complaining about that runtime at all. Giant is the story of a cattle rancher played by Rock Hudson. The creation of this cattle empire. It's like Yellowstone. If Yellowstone wasn't painfully annoying. Do not at me, Yellowstone fans. I had to cover that show for an entire year. I loved all of the different avenues that this movie takes with the West. And it's remarkably progressive for 1956. Rock Hudson plays Jordan Benedict. He meets right off the bat, literally within the first 10 minutes of the movie, he meets Leslie, played by Elizabeth frickin' Taylor on a horse. He wants to marry her, but she is a modern woman. I love the interplay between the two of them where he's talking to the menfolk and she wants to be involved in the conversation. And they're like, you can go up to bed, little missy. You don't have to deal with money and finances. And she's like, go screw yourself. I'm going to stand here and tell you my thoughts. There's a lot of really interesting discussion about masculinity. Rock Hudson's character wants his son to be a man. His wife keeps saying, no, actually, you're doing horrific things to him in the name of him being masculine. I love that interplay. I cannot think of another movie in 1956 that was talking about those interrelationships, about how we raise our children and what defines manhood, what defines femininity. The cast is brilliant. I mentioned those two. James Dean is in this as well. And there's a really great interplay with the discussion of class. His character, Jet Rink, is poor. Jordan is this guy that's the 1%. And how does that relationship work? There's also a really, and it's for 1956, and we ain't at 100%, but really interesting look at race, specifically the relationship between American colonizers in Texas and Mexicans. There's a really beautiful speech that one of the characters gives about the Mexican people were on this land before we were here. 
the way that the characters are eventually going to intermarry and intermix, it's a very pointed on the nose message about race for 1956. But the fact that they're talking about it at all is utterly amazing. It's beautifully filmed. I fell in love with this movie. Carol Baker's in it, my buddy Carol Baker. But I think she's the last living member of Giant. She's got a really great little part. It gets to work with James Dean. I just loved it. It's a beautiful, beautiful, sprawling epic. It is an epic in the sense that it is all-encompassing and sumptuous, but it does not forsake an ounce of that runtime. Everything matters. Everything is to the point. I was so happy by the end of the movie that I was just like, damn. It's that kind of movie that just makes you sit back and say, they don't make those like this anymore. Giant. Finally saw it. I respect people who current day set to make out those movies and they still do happen. I just feel more and more that runtimes are a very political thing now. I don't know if it's because all the streamers are aiming at one point to be able to put ads in everything that they show. So they might as well make it really, really long so they can make more money off of it. Or the worst is when they turn something that should be a two hour movie into a 10 episode television show and you just want to murder yourself by episode five because there's no reason for it to be there. I'm relieved to hear that Giant is poignant at every single scene of the movie. I do have to shout out to when I got to go to the Warner Brothers archives for a private tour, which I did write about. You can read that over at TickWishBiz.com. I got to see one of Liz Taylor's outfits from this movie. And the fact that it is still in brilliant condition is fantastic. And she was so small. I just was shocked by that. I was just like, girl, I don't even think a child could wear these clothes. And she was not flat chested either. I don't know how that was working out. Emily, what was your number one? The ultimate classic film discovery for 2023. My number one. Here's a fun little fact. I googled the name of the movie while I was watching it because I was like, I want to see what people have said about this. And it brought me to ticklishbiz.com. And I was so thrilled that I got to read your thoughts on it while I was watching it because I was like, oh, let's see what Kristen had to say. And so if you're ever watching a classic film, you can probably find Kristen's thoughts on it if you search for it while you're watching it because ticklishbiz.com is an incredible resource. That being said, my favorite classic movie that I experienced for the first time this past year is, I believe it's 1937's delightful screwball comedy, Topper, with Cary Grant. Adorable. And so that's what I was talking about where I was like, I love screwballs. I love Cary Grant. I've never seen this one. Let's watch it. Turns out Cary Grant's first screwball is freaking adorable. And I love it. It's basically Beetlejuice, but not. He's got chemistry with everybody, including the chair that he sits down in, in the meeting scene. And it's just wonderful and delightful. Is it super, super famous? Not really, even though it won a bunch of Oscars. It's a wonderful way to pass the afternoon. It is such a fun movie. And I stress that it's a fun movie because the sequel's do not have the same panache after yeah. that. They did a sequel with just Constance Bennett. As much as Cary Grant is really a supporting performer in this film, you need him. You lose a big something with the sequel. Yeah. And then the third one, it has Joan Blondell, which is nice. This is one of those, when we talked about The Thin Man mm-hmm. and how you kind of needed the alcoholism of the first film, yeah. you can feel that the code just sapped something out of this. Topper is able to thread that needle really well because it's the story of two people who spend their time being drunk and messing around and die for it at the beginning. They're punished for their sins right at the opening. Yeah. But they still have a great time even though they're dead. Yeah. You know, the scribble has a really interesting perspective on both the American dream and the horribleness of America, depending on who you're asking. The joy of being an idle rich person. America approaches the idle rich as like, this is the best thing you could ever hope to be. Everybody should be working to become an idle rich person. But also you have that puritanical streak of we don't really like the idle rich because they're idle and they are just having fun and they're indulging themselves all the time. And Topper is a really interesting play on, like you said, they have to die. They croak. They are killed in a horrible automobile accident because they're driving drunk and being stupid. Don't drink and drive, friends. And so much of the screwball is very frequently the stodgy, not rich person learning how to be 
insouciant, like the idle rich. I'm thinking of like Holiday, even where he's like, I'm a working class. And most of the ones that I'm going to reference are Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn movies because they're just a couple goals for the rest of my life. The person who is not of means also learning something from someone who is rich and cavalier and not serious. And so Topper is really interesting because they have to like, do that from beyond the grave. <laughs> I don't think you could make Topper today because nobody would ever be that cavalier about life and death and silly things like that. But man, it's just funny and good. It's just funny and good. I want a funny, good movie that's made recently. I love that you discovered Topper. It's so fun. It's so sweet. It's why screwballs work so well. The ending shot of them leaning over the edge of the house and their hair is all messed up and they're watching him and reconnect with his wife. And they're just kind of like, well, our work here is done. And their hair is all messed up. And then they just retreat over the gutter. This is a stupid gag, but it's really good. And it's really funny. And I just love it. If you're looking for adorable. more ghostly hijinks, have you seen Blythe Spirit? No, but I also went on a no coward streak for a long time this year. And I just didn't want to recommend like all no coward movies. So I didn't. Life Spirit is up. also good and has a remarkably dark ending that only the Brits were going to do. That's why I do love me some British classic film because they weren't afraid to go there. My number one is if we're talking about just good fun movies, I spent this year, I just looked at IMDb and I believe I have officially finished Judy Holiday's entire filmography. Unfortunately, way too short of a career, but I finished that this year and you can see one of the other Judy Holiday movies also made my full list over at the website. My number one classic film discovery that I just fell in love with, I laughed, I cried, it was so much fun, is 1960s Bells Are Ringing. Vincent Minnelli directed, written by Betty Comden and Adolph Green, who I generally don't like their writing work. Sorry, people who love the bandwagon. I don't love that movie. I decided to take a chance on this one. It has a plot that only could have worked in 1960. Judy Holliday plays a woman named Ella Peterson who works for a telephone answering service. She is involved in the lives of all of the people who call. So she's giving advice to people. Somebody calls, their kid wants to talk to Santa, and she is Santa Claus on the phone. She is overly involved in everybody's life. She falls in love with a composer named Jeffrey Moss, played by Dean Martin. She tries to help him through a series of hijinks that involve a false name. He's not aware that she is the woman that he's been talking to on the phone. Very much a standard rom-com situation. And at the same time, the telephone answering service is being investigated because there's a belief that it's actually some sort of prostitution service. I don't know why prostitution came through a lot in the movies I watched this year. And also there's a subplot about the mob, because the mob showed up in every movie. Judy Holiday, this was her last film that she made before dying way too young. She is just utterly brilliant in it. If you've only seen her in something like Born Yesterday, which is a movie I adore, she has such depth in this movie. She's sweet. She's vulnerable. She has great chemistry with Dean Martin, an actor who, again, I'm probably going to turn a lot of people off. I don't generally like, but he is so good in this movie as well, playing an average guy in a movie that has a lot of really high concept characters. Frank Gorshin's here playing a clear Brando ripoff, but it's so sweet. It is the gold standard if you love stuff like When Harry Met Sally or just any of those 80s, 90s rom-coms. Bells Are Ringing is clearly what they're going off of. The songs are great. The costumes are beautiful. But it's all about Judy Holiday. At the end of this movie, I was sitting alone in my room in the dark clapping. This is so good. I would love to see this on a big screen because I am sure it would only be even more powerful to see it on a big screen. That was my number one of the year. I love it. That makes me so happy. I know it's on my watch list. I read the blurb of it and I was like, oh, I really want to see that. And it looks just delightful. And especially it, Dean Martin, who knew? It is, yeah. And I know Samantha is a big fan of it. I know when I told her that I watched it, she was like, thank God, because it's really good. I know I'm not original, but it's so great. So let's talk about honorable mentions. Emily, you had a couple you wanted to throw out. What almost made your list? We have strict criteria for this list. What's not strict is just pre-1970 and it's a movie. 75. But I wanted to adhere to what you told me. There are movies that I watched 
that I won't say that I loved, but I realized that they're incredibly seminal movies. So my honorable mention list is, like I mentioned, went on a Noel Coward streak for a little while. The Grass is Greener, 1960. It is Cary Grant and Robert Mitchum. And Cary Grant's wife is cheating on him openly with Jim. It's very weird. It's really weird. Have you seen this? I need to see this movie right now. I have okay. never seen this. I need to watch this. It's on Canopy, or at least it's on the Los Angeles Public Library Canopy. She's just openly cheating on him. And Robert Mitchum shows up at their house because they're landed gentry. And he's just like, yeah, I'm stripping your wife. And Cary Grant's like, what can I do about it? And the answer is nothing. And it's super The answer weird. really is nothing. <laughs> it's fantastic. Second honorable mention is HUD, which I can't say I enjoyed watching, but I realize it's a fantastic movie. It's one of those movies where I hate everything that's happening on the screen, but I realize this is a really, really well-made movie. Third honorable mention is a television movie, which is why I didn't include it. It's the pilot for Columbo, which is called Prescription Murder. And I know that sounds insane, but go back and watch it because it's literally as good as rope. I'm not even joking. It's phenomenal. And you're just going like, really? Peter Falk? No, go and watch it. It's on Amazon Prime. Just watch it. It's phenomenal. And then I will say, farewell, my lovely 1975 Robert Mitchum playing Philip Marlowe. Doesn't work at all because he's way too old, but it has inspired me to go back and rewatch Every single iteration of Philip Marlowe on screen, there's a lot of weird people who have played him over the years, and I'll probably end up doing video essays about it for the show because why not? I love that you saw HUD. HUD is one of those movies, and I already know we have plans to talk about another movie, but HUD is a great example when I tell people I do not care sometimes if somebody plays just an utterly reprehensible person. It just makes me love you more. It's a problem. It's it's, it's psychologically problem. damaging. HUD is a great example. Until you get to the end, you're like, oh, it's kind of horrible, but like... And Patricia Neal is so amazing. Patricia Neal is so good. Patricia Neal is so good. A couple honorable mentions from me. Again, you can see the full list over at ticklishbiz.com, but I did want to make the argument for the 1952's The Fabulous Senorita I watched this during one of the Rita Moreno tributes that TCM did. It's so good. It's Delita Rodriguez, very unsung actress, fantastic performer, really weird plot. Definitely worth watching. 1929's Pandora's Box, Louise Brooks' silent film, German. It's super great. Definitely check it out. 1924's Bo Brummel. I really got into silent films this year, and I did not expect to be interested in John Barrymore movies. Bo Brummel is really great. It's star-crossed lover story. It's also really creepy and weird to watch considering that Mary Astor was 18 when she starred in this and was dating John Barrymore, who was 42. Different times. <laughs> Speaking of Patricia Neal, 1949's John Loves Mary. It's a Ronald Reagan movie, so you take that mm. how you will. But it's a really good romantic comedy and Patricia Neal's first film. And 1961's Come September with Rock Hudson and Gina Lola Brigida. I was shocked that this was directed by a pre To Kill a Mockingbird, Robert Mulligan. It's a really great comedy about a stodgy American goes to Europe and finds out that his really expensive house is being used as an Airbnb for a group of rascally teens led by Sandra D. And it's really sweet. And 1957's Funny Face with Audrey Hepburn. She has no chemistry with Fred Astaire. The movie is so gorgeous. It's so gorgeous. I loved it. There's far more on the list over at ticklishbiz.com. You can read all of my picks there. We also got quite a few listener responses, which I did want to share with everybody. We did get Samantha's list, which included, for her, Samantha picked number five, A Matter of Life and Death from 1946. Number four, The Oxbow Incident made two of the lists. Number three was 1948's Bicycle Thieves. Her number two was 1948's Unfaithfully Yours. And her number one was 1945's The Clock with Judy Garland, which is a movie I adore. Happy to hear that. We got a lot of responses from the listeners on social. At Melanie Marquita said her picks were 1954's Too Bad, She's Bad, 1960's Il Bell Antonio, 1963's Any Number Can Win, and 1969's The Sicilian Clan. James L. Nybauer said, I finally got around to Bridge on the River Kwai and Magnificent Ambersons. 
each lives up to its massive hype. At Reb6126 said 1957's A Face in the Crowd. Classic Movie Man said The Velvet Touch with Rosalind Russell saw it on the big screen at Noir City, Chicago this year. At Silent Sean 95 said a good mix of obscure and well-known classics, 1929's Applause, 1931's Over the Hill, 1933's Employee's Entrance, the 1943 film The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, 1946's My Darling Clementine, so Sean knows it's great, 1953's Roman Holiday, and 1964's Failsafe, which I know, Emily, you have talked about how great that movie is. I love that movie so much. Christine at Susanna Foster said her top three for the year are 1945's Hangover Square, 1958's Cry Terror, and 1932's They Call It Sin. Our former guest Chris Mitch said Spite Marriage from 1929, 1955 Six Bridges to Cross, Bud Abbott and Luke Costello Meet Frankenstein from 1948, 1966's Moment to Moment, and the 1958 film, The Music Room. Matt Duffy 33 had said that a year for watching films that I've been dying to see, I can't identify everything based off the pictures he posted, but I can identify Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and Key Largo. I think he also picked Tea and Sympathy. Matt, if you're listening, let us know what the last picture is because I cannot figure out what movie it is from. At Ghostly's Grace said, I discovered so many great films this year. Here are my four favorites, 1963's La Bai de Anges, I hope I said that correctly, 1961's The Children's Hour, 1950's Sunset Boulevard, and 1946's It's a Wonderful Life. That might be the first time I've heard somebody say they just discovered It's a Wonderful Life. I'm impressed. Thank you, everybody who submitted your picks. Feel free to keep sending them in if you didn't have time and you've discovered some new stuff. I can only imagine what we will discover next year throughout this year because this was a good year for classic discoveries that's going to close out ticklish business for today we are available on all podcast apps including apple podcasts and spotify reviews matter we would love to start off 2024 with a review so leave us one five stars on apple podcast you can follow us on twitter at ticklish underscore biz as well as on facebook instagram and tiktok at ticklish biz you can always find my writing over at the rap.com and i am on all social media at Kristen Lopez 88. Emily Edwards is over at Ms. Emily Edwards, predominantly on Blue Sky. Our Patreon, as always, helps keeps the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content like our amazing Maria Cooper Janice interview. And we also are going to be doing a new episode of Being Elvis, talking about Sofia Coppola's Priscilla. Consider helping us at patreon.com slash Ticklish Biz. We also have our books out. And if you are listening to our Patreon content. You can listen to that over at Spotify. If you look for the Ticklish Biz RSS feed, it is available on there. And of course, our archive going all the way back to episode one is over at ticklishbusiness.podbean.com. We will be back on February 14th with our first theme of the year. We are going to be taking a cue from Emily's podcast, The Amazing Fuckboys of Literature, and we are going to be doing Fuckboys of Classic Film, starting with a look at the Paul Newman film, The Long Hot Summer. Excited to start Valentine's Day off right. Till then. <laughs> <laughs>